Mayor Duggan, State of the City, where is Detroit headed? Our roundtable hashes it out. Plus, a one Detroit special report on dreamers in limbo and how to engage more people in the political process. We'll hear what Citizen Detroit is doing. Stay there. My week is coming right up. I have a question. Who wants to go first to win? Who wants to grow our business? Who wants to make more money? Who wants more job opportunities? If you want Michigan to compete and become a top 10 state, raise your hand. Together, we've turned Michigan around and started moving forward. Now help us build a stronger Michigan than ever. Raise your hand at StrongerMichigan.com. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding for this program is provided by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing. Hi there and welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. We are so glad that you are with us. We have a full show for you with our roundtable, some familiar and new faces for you. We'll take a closer look at Mayor Mike Duggan's State of the City address and his focus on education. Also coming up, a One Detroit special report, how life has changed for local dreamers days after the DACA deadline has come and gone, plus the impact of immigration talks in D.C. And getting more people engaged with political decisions and feeling like they're part of the process. You'll hear about Citizen Detroit. That is all coming up on my week. But let's get to Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan's State of the City address, and we'll do it with our roundtable tonight. Of course, you know my week contributor, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News. It's always good to see you, Nolan. And welcome back to the table, Chastity Pratt Dawsey from Bridge Magazine. And joining us for the first time is Misha Stallworth. She's a member of the Detroit Board of Education. Misha, welcome to my week. Thanks. All right. It's good to have you guys here. And uh, we're going to start off taking a look at Mayor Duggan's State of the City address. And you know what? When when Mayor Duggan gets on a roll in front of a crowd with a PowerPoint presentation, I mean, there's no there's no turning back. The animation yeah. and the passion that I think that comes out that you see that he brings to everything that he's he's trying to do in the city right now. Nolan, I'm going to start off with you. Yeah. What your impressions were of hearing some of the some of the numbers that he was throwing out in terms of crime and in terms of, of housing and education. Well, we call it a Detroit for Detroiter speech. He was clearly talking to the people who have stayed in Detroit and endured the hard times and trying to convince them to that he's going to bring the good times to them you know keep staying you know con continue to to stick with the city and you know i think it was an important message to people who have felt left out uh, as the conversation has been so heavily focused on downtown. He didn't mention downtown one time in terms of its development or its future. It was all about the neighborhood. A smart move, because mm -hmm. also not only you're trying to make sure that people feel comfortable staying where they right. are, but then encouraging people to come into the city, Chastity, to grow that population, which is one of the flags and the hallmarks that Mayor Duggan has said, judge me on this because I'm going to make sure that people come in and see that we grow the city. Right. I mean, the state of the city is, um, you know, it's an update on a, the familiar things. He talked about crime. He talked mm -hmm. about the neighborhoods. He talked about uh, the the um, the thing that I really uh, was interested in was the fire department and how they're now involved with first right. responding and how they've mm -hmm. cut the time um, that you get an ambulance or a first responder to your home. So he talked about a lot of the familiar things and gave us updates. I was left wanting more uh, uh information on new projects, on, like you said, new ideas to bring people to the city, to, to grow uh, the, the population. Um, the update's good, but let's hear a little bit more about what's next. I think what's always really interesting, Misha, is the order that you choose to start to hear things. And he started with, with education and kids first, which he has not done in years past. It's maybe been about crime first, or it's been uh, looking at abandoned housing or how they're gonna change housing situation. He focused really on kids, because I think in years past, he said, there's not really much that I can do with the school system. I'm not in charge of the school mm -hmm. system. But now I think he's finding ways to say, gosh, if we're gonna make sure that more people are moving into the city, we have to fix DPS and we have to fix the state of charter schools. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, both within DPSCD and across other city entities, we know that the need for partnership is incredibly essential um, for the city abroad and also for our young people. It's just important to also make sure that each entity um, is rec recognizes 
their own power structure and the ways in which they do kind of control their system. So I think in the past where he said, there's nothing I can do, um, you know, he still does not have authority over the schools. However, moving forward, there are opportunities for partnerships, especially with the way, the direction that we're going right now. Yeah, and he's quite, he's quite a big power broker in that and being able to bring in skillmen or saying, you know, now charter yeah. schools and DPSCD, you have to work together to make sure that, that we can kind of figure this out and looking at that Northwest Detroit project well, in terms of transportation. I do think the difference is that he feels he has a partner. I think before, prior, prior, he didn't want this thing to wind up in his lap. Now, I think he's confident in Dr. Vitti and the school board that if he that he his role can be an assist he can improve do the things a mayor can do without having responsibility for the performance or of the schools I think the bus idea I mean transportation is a huge issue for people trying to get their kids to school I mean you have kids out there spending hour two hours on the bus trying to get to a school that's not all that far away they're not learning anything on a bus you cut that time down you allow people to choose the schools that are best for their kid whether they're public or charter no matter where they are in the city and then guarantee that the kids gonna be able to get there I think that's a big move for for uh, reassuring families and keeping families in place. Misha, well, uh, okay, go ahead. The, the, the bus idea is, is one of those ideas that um, we used to have a, one school district. Now we have several school systems in one city, right? Mm -hmm. and, and trying to, to have a one bus system or one food system, it's like putting it all back together again, taking mm -hmm. it apart just to put it back together again. And it's going to be problematic because now you have all these entities involved, right? But the, it's way past time for the city and these schools to have talked about collaborating and moving education forward. We have the city owns 70 school buildings. Why is there no discussion on what this, this or school properties? Why is there no discussion about what's going to happen there? There needs to be some discussion about. Uh, there is some beginning of discussion about vocational training and Randolph and things the city and the schools can do better together. But this whole idea of collaborating, it should have happened 20 years ago. There needs to be more discussion. There needs to be more community involvement in the city and the schools working together. And with the end game being more jobs, kids and, and young adults being ready for jobs in the workplace. That needs to be the goal. Or right. else Lear and Amazon ain't coming. Well, All right, Misha. Now, hang on. Misha's on the school board. So <laughs> she's on the Detroit school board. Give me uh, your sense of, from the, a board member's perspective, of things that you did hear, um, not only in the speech, or then now what Chastity is saying in terms of coordinating service. So, I, I mean, I do think that there is a need for partnership. Obviously, there's still a driving competition component. Um, you know, as a district, we do want students to be in our district we do need the funding can we do ever get away from that or no I don't know that I don't know that we can because to Chastity's point there are all these different systems that are operating in their own best interests in the same place I think the the point here and with the example of the bus loop is here's an example of where you can come together and you can collaborate even if there are other areas where you can't and it's still to the betterment of the global community um, which for the mayor and from the city's perspective that global community that is the point but I think people want to know how deep are these discussions between the schools and the city as far as working together Together on the bus loop, on you know, land usage, on uh, trade, uh, vocational training. How deep are the discussions? I, I mean, they are ongoing. Uh, Dr. Vitti came on board in May, right, of last year, then had to figure out everything that was going on with our system. Um, simultaneously, the Coalition 2.0 with Skillman was ongoing, and there were board members who were participating on those different committees. So through kind of a lot of different venues, these conversations have been happening since really board members have been seated. Um, and then now, as Dr. Vidi is really kind of amping up, he's able to have more in-depth discussions as well as the board president, Iris Taylor. Have you been confident in his leadership so far? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think Dr. Vitti is amazing. I think that in addition to his skill set being incredibly on point for what we need, his value system is also really in line with our community and then also with the district and, and with that community into itself as well. Uh, taking a look at it, the overarching themes of um, uh, also the State of the City presentation and stepping a little bit back from education and looking at crime. Nolan, you talked mm -hmm. to um, Police Chief James Craig last week at mm -hmm. um, the Detroit Policy Conference. Um, did you get a sense from him that he is moving in the right direction and that people are feeling confident in some of the policing uh, opportunities that, that, they, that they're working on and some of the different initiatives that they've taken on? Well, I think as the mayor pointed out, the murder rate is still way too high. The violence rate's way too high. I mean, when you compare to other cities, 
uh, of this size, but it's going down, and that's positive. And I, I like the fact that he talked about the test programs they did, Project Ceasefire, Greenlight, and talked about expanding things that work or that appear to be working. I think that's a good approach, and the 141 new officers should help. Last, uh, last thoughts, Chastity? Um, the state of the city, I'm not sure that people in the city of Detroit got a huge new message, but I think a lot of people were excited that he talked so much about the neighborhoods. There's something to the staying the course message, Misha, that, that people heard? Yeah, definitely. I think he has been very consistent, very clear about scaffolding this work. I think I tend to get a little... Mm, Frustrated with the noble Detroiter who stayed narrative only because so many people stayed because they didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the ways that we need to structure our services and, and programs has to also be directed to that very particular corner. I think that's a really Detroiters. interesting conversation that I'd love to continue to have, but we're going to have to leave it there. Misha Stallworth, thanks so much for joining us on My Week, your first time. Make yeah. sure you come back again. Chastity Pratt, Jazzy, and of course, Nolan will see you again next week. Yep. All right, turning now to a One Detroit special report on a deadline for so-called dreamers that has come and gone. March 5th was supposed to be the end of the DACA program, according to President Trump, but court decisions have forced the administration to keep issuing renewals. Just this week, President Trump says he wants a DACA fix, but he can't get Democrats on board. While politics play out in Washington, there are about 6,700 DACA recipients in Michigan, 700,000 nationwide, who have jobs, pay taxes, are going to school, and are making a life here. But it's an uncertain life. I met up with Juan Gonzalez last week, who is a dreamer and has become a vocal leader for change. He admits the last six months haven't been easy. Uh, tell me about the T-shirt. We met Juan Gonzalez on his lunch hour downtown. He's an underwriter with Quicken Loans, age 24, a DACA recipient who came to the U.S. at the age of one, undocumented. When Trump was elected, I knew I had to do something different. And it was actually when the first Muslim man was shot down in court that I became determined that I want to be, you know, a part of the judicial branch. I want to be in the judicial system. So I started going back to school. Gonzalez now wants to be a lawyer. He's full time at Wayne State University while working the loans and fighting for DACA. Juan Gonzalez. Thank you, sir. Southwest Detroit last September, a protest just days after President Trump called for the end of DACA. Gonzalez was one of just a few DACA recipients to pick up the microphone. With DACA, I was able to get a job, buy a house, buy a car, go to school full time, work full time. It's been a great time, honestly. It's been marvelous. But now that's all in danger. President Trump had set a six-month deadline for Congress to replace President Obama's 2012 DACA order with a DACA law Trump could sign. So now it's up to us to push Congress to actually pass something. It's up to us to stand up. It's not just retweets and liking things on Facebook. We have to come out and do this. We have to scream. We have to yell. We've always kept under the ropes. We've stayed in the shadows. And so on top of the fact that we're being faced with deportation soon and there's a spotlight on me now, it's a little bit, you know, frightening, but I mean, someone has to speak out. Our stories have to be heard and if you don't speak out, it's obviously going to remain, you know. Have people said, Juan, stop talking, like you're going to get yourself into trouble or are they saying, thanks for talking because I don't feel like I can, I don't feel like I can speak up? They tell me to keep going, to never stop fighting and especially for something that I believe in this passionately and this strongly about. I mean. I've received no negative feedback from, from anyone. They've told me just keep going. Gonzalez and other activists are now trying to keep DACA in the headlines. Trump's deadline lapsed this week, but now Congress has more time to act because federal courts stopped President Trump from shutting DACA down. So DACA remains alive for now. Since the Supreme Court decision, has there been a sigh of relief for you that that March 5th deadline now doesn't have the weight that it did have? Uh, it definitely opens up my options in terms of time. Now I can extend my work permit, have another two years, but it's it's still only temporary. What happens if within a week Trump says, oh, I'm reversing DACA on these terms, and then that has to go to court again, this whole prolonged legal battle that's, you know, it leaves us in the air, it leaves us in limbo still. So we're technically still in the same spot. So, Of concern, Trump can change deportation rules to include DACA recipients. U of D Mercy law professor Andrew Moore says those with DACA need to avoid encounters with the authorities and be careful to not do anything that might blemish a clean criminal record. Now it seems the Trump administration is trying to use any explanation they can find for someone who's currently in DACA 
to revoke it. Um, so although the March 5th deadline is now, I think, suspended, still the Trump administration is doing their very best to try and get as many of these folks uh, out, of the, out of DACA and therefore out of the country. I'm afraid, yes. 29-year-old DACA recipient Annaline Morales came from Mexico at age 14 to live with her mother in Pontiac. She says DACA changed her life six years ago. She could drive and get a job without fear. Now the uncertainty from the president is taking its toll. One day I'm okay saying, I'm going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. Nothing is going to happen. I go to sleep without knowing if tomorrow he's going to say, you know what? Please look for every single DACA student and we're going to do something with them. At Oakland Community College in Auburn Hills, Morales was president of the student government last year. Now she wants to study journalism and political science at Michigan State University. It's very sad because they're playing with us. They, they playing with our lives and it's not okay. Back in September, President Trump said that he needed a, a clean dream act. Till now he's not doing anything. He haven't done anything because he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He hasn't been in our shoes to really feel our pain. What's the plan for you now for the next couple of months? Where does it go from here? Stay active, keep demanding a, a clean dream act. I don't dictate my plans around what someone else is going to do. I dictate on what I'm going to do and I'm going to keep fighting for the Clean Dream Act. I'm going to keep going to school to become a lawyer and I'm going to keep working, working hard at this. And for more One Detroit special reports on immigration reforms and the processes we do have in place, head to our website at myweek.org. Finally tonight, a look at engaging more people in the political process. Citizen Detroit is a five-year-old organization that works to help people feel invested in decisions that are being made in the city. The organization just got a new grant for $1.5 million from the Knight Foundation to bring more people to the table. I had a great conversation with Sheila Cockrell, former Detroit City Councilwoman and Executive Director of Citizen Detroit, and Katie Locker, the Detroit Program Director for the Knight Foundation, about ways they're bringing more voices to the table. I want to talk about what Citizen Detroit is doing because it's talking about getting people more civically engaged. Correct. And that's what you've been doing for the last five years, but now it's kind of this 2.0. So Absolutely. give everyone an idea of what Citizen Detroit is doing now and where it's going to go. Well, Dr. Irv Reed from Wayne State, President Emeritus of Wayne State, and I started Citizen Detroit to provide Detroit residents with trustworthy, factually based information about public policies uh, and issues that are facing the city and to give Detroiters a chance to, to make their own decisions about uh, about candidates running for office. Knight's been a, uh, a sponsor from the very beginning. Our first $10,000 came from the Knight Foundation. We've been able to build on that and really want to take uh, the platforms that we've developed really to the next level uh, with more research, more creative games and, and activities for people to like learn about how government works and how important democracy flourishes when people are engaged and make informed decisions. That's what we're all about. It's really kind of connecting people, yes. you know, into the into yeah. the system and making them feel that they're a part of it. So Katie, what is it that Knight found so attractive to this and then helping build it even further with this huge infusion of money? Well, you know, Knight's history is journalism, but our mission is informed and engaged communities, which obviously journalism is a part of. But really we want to say how do we contribute to democratic engagement and community information at a time when Detroit is undergoing so much change. There's people feeling left out. There's people feeling like they don't have all the information. And so, as Sheila said, this is uh, the end of the four years of investment. Started with $10,000. We just announced $1.5 million because what Sheila and her team are doing is making sure Detroiters have access to quality, nonpartisan information that they can trust, and then, even more importantly, that then they can then talk to each other about it in a respectful way and, and see what do we do next? What are we supposed to do with this information and how do we engage with our government, with each other, to, to continue to make Detroit better? Sheila, who's, who's coming to these events that you're doing? Um, and talk to me a little bit about what some of the concerns are that people sure. are when they're, when they're coming in. Um, 
the, the, our base is registered voters in Detroit, so we, we have collected data, the show gives us information on people who we call high performance voters to people who are registered but rarely vote or don't vote, mm -hmm. and we try to create, we create opportunities for people to come together around issues that people care about. Education and safety are two issues that people in the city care deeply about across generations. A lot of our, 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 our more high-performance high voters in Detroit are older African-American women. Every single session, the question is, we want more young people here. We want to be talking to young people. How do you get young people interested in the process? Well, we, we're, we, have, we have a number of young people who participate as facilitators and are, are part of, and certainly in a lot of young people, helping create the experiences, and it's a, it really is an inter intergenerational learning experience. I'm, we're working on a thing now around um, uh, the, there was a manual that the, that the school system had years ago, a citizen manual, that we're looking to update to the 21st century. So I have people saying, what do you know about the Detroit plan from 1963? And it sounds a lot like what people are trying to do today, and my thing was, yes, but that was more about urban renewal. and. You know, uh, keep keeping some people out of neighborhoods or shutting down neighborhoods, that's not clearly the direction today. So it's a chance to, um, to, to give young people ways to learn the history and for older people to learn that there's new history being made and what makes Detroit a vital, vibrant community is the intergenerational sharing and working together to create the next Detroit 2.0. And making sure that people have access to this kind yes. of information. Yeah. I gotta say, we had this event uh, last week that was an announcement of the grant, but also a celebration of Detroiters being engaged. And uh, Mr. Jones was right. there from Clement Gardens, right? From Clement Gardens. Gardens. At, Mr. Jones had a story to tell, and he was in his 80s, he told us all that. And, you know, there were 20-something, 30-something, 40-something who can benefit from what Mr. Jones has to say. And then I think between generations, also there's a real appreciation by younger Detroiters that there's some people who stuck it out here when it wasn't a big, exciting, we're, we're revitalizing, all these kinds of messages now. They stuck it out, they saw what's happened, they've learned a lot, and we have to learn from them, and we have right. to respect their knowledge, As institution, too. Institutional and knowledge. that's where Sheila's leadership, and then the grant allows her to hire a team that right. is a lot younger. <laughs> they, they make Sheila a little uncomfortable sometimes, <laughs> but that's what we need. We gotta respect yeah. incredible history of leadership, and, and then we have to figure out how the next generation uses that knowledge to move and forward. And pivotal the political process in looking at 2018 as well and getting people oh, yes. engaged. Oh, yes. Oh, very much so. We're gonna, yeah. we're gonna, we have a website called informeddetroit.org. Mm -hmm. We're going to offer everybody who's running for any office that Detroit is going to vote on a chance to make a three-minute video. And we're gonna, then we need to market that heavily so that people know uh, where to go get it. Last year we had a great collaboration with WDET, with the Michigan Chronicle, with Channel 4, and with uh, the Free Press, and DET was able to really use the videos. They had over 25,000 people look at the videos on their website. So people do, people want to make informed decisions. We're going we're gonna to make the effort to try to get a video of everybody running for judge. Uh, that's going to be on a Detroit ballot because that's something people never so know. They who to say, vote for. you know what? Either they skip it or they right, just say, well, exactly. you know, I don't even and know. And that, that diminishes engagement if people feel that I don't know enough to vote on something. Mm -hmm. So, really, this notion that democracy thrives, and since we know democracy is under threat right now, people are deeply interested in, in being more directly engaged themselves. But people want to know in the era of fake news that I'm getting real trustworthy facts. So, there's not a thing we put out that we don't have multi-source. You may not like the fact, but Jack, it's a fact. Yeah. So you can deal with, it, with that. <laughs> it's always great to talk to Sheila Cockrell and to Katie Locker. To learn more about Citizen Detroit, just head to myweek.org. That's gonna do it for us. Make sure you connect with us, Facebook and Twitter. I'm Christy McDonald. We'll see you next time for My Week. Take care.